make some acknowledgments before I introduce our guests. Uh, I would like to thank the Maynard Foundation, uh, my fellow board members in the Historical Society, and the membership for, that, for their support of this event. Really, thank you. I would like to acknowledge also Dr. Jeffrey uh, Shepard, who's the chair of the Department of History at UTEP, who's come all the way over to um, hear us and participate tonight. So thank you so much. Tonight we have an unusual format in that we have two speakers. Uh, so first, um, Mr. Joe Sines will speak for half an hour and then we'll have five minutes for questions. And then Mr. William Bradford will speak for half an hour and then we'll have time for questions. So, without further ado, our first speaker, Mr. Joe Sines, who I heard first at the Gila River Festival last fall and was impressed, and I think you will be too. Okay. Um, he is a co-director of the Chiricahua Apache National Foundation, a council member of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, native owner, operator of Wolf Horse Outfitters, a wilderness guide, warrior, activist, dad, son, and brother. So a warm Columbus welcome for Mr. Holmes. Shai, Shambatsu Nabetin, Shima Huicho, Shita Tsihe Nde, Hahanda Ndebena. My name is Joe Sines. Uh, I introduce myself in our language. Um, translation is um, my uh, name that I use sometimes is uh, uh, on the wolf trail, and that's the, that's the name. Uh, introduce my mom's side, who are Wicho Indians from North Central Mexico, and my dad's side, who are uh, Warm Springs Apache, and we come from this country. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for allowing us to come in and just share share some things with you guys. Um, we have been trying to make ourselves available to uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, we feel that this has been a long time coming for us. Uh, we are one of the few tribes that is fighting to return back to their original home country. And, you know, at first there was an idea of myself Coming back, uh, I grew up in Isleta, Texas, just east of El Paso. Uh, that's where my family gravitated to, uh, starting with my grandfather. Uh, reasons, you know, uh, there in itself is, is a story all by itself. Um, but all of us, we, I have been calling this kind of a collective consciousness because there are so many of us that have returned and are returning to this country. Uh, we now have in this region, we now have four major, major Apache organizations that are trying to establish and settle in, uh, you know, even including Fort Sill, who's on I-10. Uh, there is a Chihene group that what we understand is some, some remnants of it is still left there in Las Cruces. There is a group that... Uh, was affected, as my family for a certain point too, was affected by what's called the Relocation Act, where they spread a bunch of Indians everywhere they could. Uh, but those, those families have a tie back here and they've come back here and tried to reestablish. And then we have our, our tribal organization in the Silver City area. We call ourselves the Chiricahua Apache Nation. Um, when I came back, I, I left this area for a while um, just because I the way that I grew up with my parents, how they shared about the environment, the land, uh, our place in it. Uh, I just wanted to see North America. So I traveled around, went to Alaska, Canada. Um, finally decided those places are, as beautiful as they are, they're very difficult to, places to live. I mean, the, when I started thinking about coming home, it was about how long are the winters. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I considered Canada. It was for me. It was a great place there. I, I lived on the uh, Blood Reservation, the Kainais, with the Kainai people. 
Uh, but their winters are eight months. You know, I lived in Alaska, it was nine to ten months of winter. So as I moved further down, I lived in Colorado for a little while, that's six or seven months of winter. So, so it finally it dawned on me, everything was telling me to come back home. Um, so I decided to make the, the, the leap and just uh, consider myself uh, lucky to have a home to come back to. So when I came back to this area, one of the first things that that I had to deal with was the stories that came back to me from growing up. Uh, the way that my family spoke, my grandparents. So it all kind of drew me back to this area saying, okay, well I don't want to go back to Isleta. El Paso and Isleta have grown so much, uh, it's, it's not the same. I've become so used to living in the outdoors and uh, living what my family taught me. Uh, being in the outdoors, understanding those kind of those kind of realms, uh, listening to the stories that that were reminded from my grandfather, how he used to talk about the trees and the animals. So I came back home, to what I call home here, because uh, the last of our family that was in this country was my great grandmother. Uh, they came out of the Black Range area. When the trouble started, they were part of the families that fled into the Sierra Madre. Um, and so, all of that drew me back as it has been drawing a lot of people. So when I came back, I decided, okay, I'm going to remember who I am. I'm going to go around and I'm going to check to see what everybody is saying about us. Because coming back home and growing up with the, the, the background and the cultural heritage that we had, it was, we, we were comfortable. But when I came back and started living in Silver City, I did feel this sense of, Maybe you're not welcome here mm. yet. Mm. You know, maybe there's something here. So I took it upon myself to start visiting museums, anywhere they had a collection of, of stories. I wanted to see what they said about us. So I went to the Silver City Museum. I went to, the, you know, the Heard Museum. I went to. Finally, I landed in uh, in Santa Fe and went to their cultural museum that's in the middle of the town. I don't know if you guys have ever visited. It's four stories, beautiful museum. So I went in there and thinking, okay, this museum's got to have something about us. So I go trudging up and down the floors, looking at beautiful sets of armors and weapons and Spanish and American. And I'm trudging up and down the floors and finally on the third floor I find something in a little dark corner. And it's a, it's a shadow box frame. Mm -hmm about this big, about that wide, a couple inches thick. So I look at it and I, I'm drawn to it and it's like, what is this? So I look at it and it's a, an encased peace pipe. <laughs> it's encased in, a, in the shadow box and uh, underneath it it has a little three by five card that says, this is the peace pipe that Tom Jeffords and Cochise smoked when they made that treaty. And, you know, I, I, I had to kind of giggle a little bit and go, well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Patches, we don't use pipes. We use, we make cigarettes. Uh, traditionally, we have our methods of using certain, certain type of uh, oak leaves to roll them into tubes, to tie them off, to dry them, and then we use our materials to stuff them. And any ceremony you go in Apache country, it's always cigarettes that you'll see. You'll never see pipes. We hated to carry things. We were very in tune with our environment. We didn't need much, but we didn't have to carry much either. So the idea came that there's very little things that are being said that are correct. So I marched down to the director's office of the museum and I tell her, well, you know, what, what you have here is incorrect. And it kind of flew over her head. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it really showed the understanding of our cultural history here, which uh, it's, it's understandable, we were chased out of here. We were imprisoned, we were enslaved, we were driven out, and we lost that connection to that country here. So through all our efforts, we have come back and are making an effort to reestablish ourselves. And situations like these are just great because it gives us that opportunity to share our stories. Our story is very different. We constantly argue with archaeologists and anthropologists. And since I came back and understood where we were and what we are and who we are, 
I started challenging archaeologists and anthropologists because everything that was told to us revolves around, around the land bridge theory that we came from the north and that we came through the land bridge, land bridge, the Bering Land Bridge, came through Alaska, Canada, and we ended up here. You see the maps? It's a perfect line from Africa to the tip of South America. It's like, no, no, that's uh, it's not what I grew up with. Since I was a child, you know, four or five years old, I remember my grandfather. And for whatever reason, I've always considered myself fortunate to be able to remember those stories. And as a child of four and five years old, my grandfather would say, migrations came from the south, not the north. And so ever since we've been talking, I've always challenged people, prove me wrong. The, 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 the story that changes for us is that we have always been here. We believe that there were more Genesis points around the world than just Africa. There was one here. All our stories keep us here, our creation, our e evolution, our e emergence, all come from this country. If an Indian tribe has a story that they came from somewhere else, they will tell you in their creation stories. They will outline it and tell you we came from this way, we came from that. We don't have that. I have looked. I have talked to elders. We can't find that anywhere. And so it reinforces the whole idea that, yes, we were created here and we've always been here, even before the Pueblos passed through. That's why they're not here anymore. That's why they left so little remnants of their, of their existence. We don't have large pyramids. We don't have huge villages. We don't have kivas and all that stuff. We have a few pit houses, the cliff dwellings, all of those places. Because in our stories and our tribal behavior explains that very succinctly. When we consider the, the, the story of the history here, we think about, well, how did we behave? Okay? When the Spanish first showed up here, we have them, our story tells us that we met them up by Santa Rita. They were looking for copper. When the Spanish showed up, the Apaches were there. We didn't go out and kill them. Our, our tribal code of ethics has always been peace and harmony. So anytime we meet people, our first instinct is to trade, to welcome. So when the Spanish showed up, we didn't bother them. We even told them where to find that copper. Once we saw what they were doing to the land, then it becomes a different issue because that's what our culture revol revolves around. When the Americans showed up, down here on the border, they were drawing their line. Who showed up? It's documented. Chiricahuas, Warm Springs people. Hey, new people, let's trade. So our story follows that line that when the Pueblos coming from the south, when they passed through here, it was a negotiation between us. I have asked the Hopis, explain your story to us. Tell us, <coughs> tell us how we interacted. And they confirm it. The, I've had Hopi <coughs> spiritual people tell me that when they were passing through this country, they were tired. They had been wandering for quite a while. <coughs> so when they came into contact with us, it became a negotiation. Yeah, you can stay. How many of you have been to the cliff dwellings? They tell you that those people stopped in there, stayed for 20, 30 years, and then moved on. It's a mystery. They don't know who they were, who they, where they went. We do. They never bother to ask us. But again, we believe that it was not the Mogollons, not the Membrus, not the Anasazi. To us, they're simply the ancestors of the Zunis, the Hopis, the Akamas. And the Hopis, like I said before, the Hopis have acknowledged that when they pass through here, the entire negotiation, you can stay. But don't build anything. That was one of our requirements. Once they were revived, recuperated, which is about a 20-year span, they say 20, maybe a little bit more, that at that point, that's when they left. It wasn't a drought. It wasn't anything of that nature, they were recuperated. It was time to go. So they moved. Okay. Where are the Zunis and Hopis now? You guys know where the reservations are now? Up by Gallup. Up by Gallup. That's north of us, right? Mm -hmm. Because when it was time to go, 
They were not about to turn around and go back south. They were going north. Okay? So that's why the Hopi, Zunis, Akamas are kind of sandwiched in between the Navajos and the Apaches. Okay? That's, that's what we believe. And, you know, that's, that's our perception of this. Um, and as I go, if there's any questions, you know, feel, feel free to ask. The, the topic here is so wide. And so, growing up with the stories that my grandfather told me is, is the beginnings of our organization here, of our efforts to reestablish ourselves. Finally, it's, nobody's going to be able to tell our story better than ourselves. And so we've made efforts to reestablish. Um, you know, we, we work with other historical societies. We are members of the Fort Bayard Historic Society, Preservation Society. Um, our efforts are serious. We are committed to reestablishing a headquarters at Fort Bayard, uh, also establishing a ceremonial grounds. Um, we believe that this land has missed us hearing the songs, feeling the feet, and it doesn't matter if we got chased out of here and killed, enslaved, or whatever it was, we're still here. Um, we have identified two emergent points, culturally. Uh, one of them that I understand is the Three Sisters, okay, that there, there is an emergence point there that the elders have told me about. Uh, there have been efforts to go and see it, but we understand that the rancher that bought the property is not allowing anybody to go in because that, we understand that that particular cave got abused. Uh, I hear stories 40, 50 years ago that you'd walk into that cave and there'd be crystals scattered throughout the walls. And the people have gone in there and chipped them out, broke them up, and so understandably the ranchers have you know, been reluctant to let people in. So the last year, year before, I think it was 20, um, Apaches went and did a ceremony just outside of uh, Three Sisters, but they had to do it there next to the road. Uh, the rancher wouldn't let them in. So, uh, you know, we still observe those, those, uh, those spiritual factors in our country. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, you still have still. Um, about uh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah, you're doing fine. Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, isn't the Three Sisters the area where that cave is? Isn't that BLM land? Uh, no, I think the access to it might be that you need to cross a rancher's land. Ah. Yeah, because from my understanding with elders is that the actual sacredness of Three Sisters is okay. actually on the other side of it. Okay. That there was a, an old spring there. Because our routes of travel, you know, the, if you stand, if you get up by Silver City, you can actually see the three routes of travel that we used from that country. Because the Gila in that country was basically our northern stronghold. The Sierra Madre is our southern stronghold. And so when you're in the Gila and you get into certain vantage points, you can see the routes that people took, whether you were going to eastern Chihuahua, whether you're going straight into Sierra Madre, or where you were going into into uh, Sonora. And so those paths were, you know, uh, pretty well established. And that's what I tell the Forest Service whenever we're talking about trails. Question? Was there, I used to do a thing, John McClure and I used to do a thing, it was on VHS tape in the old days. We edited on two home VCRs, it took hours. And we had a thing called Columbus Video Journal. And there was a, a gentleman lived in Demi named Bob Reinhold, and he was kind of like a, he thought he was an Indiana Jones, and he used to take us on these tours of places, and we would video it. And there's a place up near the eye of the needle, needle or whatever that's called in the, in the uh, Floridas. Floridas. Yeah. And so we went inside this cave, and there's a lot of hieroglyphics, and he said that was an Apache sacred place and we got it on video. I just have to have it transferred on the DVDs. But is there an impact? They said that's where the ancestors came out. 
Yeah. Have you heard of that in the? I've, the I've seen the cave. Actually, I've been to it. It's real narrow. Uh, yeah, it's real narrow. You got to climb yeah. like a billy goat <laughs> to get hours. up to, and it's really rough country. Yeah. Did yeah. You, is, uh, was it illegal to even probably video it? Later, we thought, oh shoot, we probably shouldn't have even done it. You know that that's one of the things that we say is that, as I was mentioning, that this whole country we lived in it and we moved around in it. We moved so much because we were not uh, nomadic. We were mobile, okay? Uh, so our movements were re revolved around plants. You know, we usually say that Apaches back then were probably 70% vegetarian. Uh, we relied more on plants than we did on animals. For animals, we had very strict, very strict rules. And so even like with the Forest Service, when they talk about all their trails, I got to remind them, no, those trails, we were living there. All these trails that you say that the, the CCC put in and the Forest Service is, is establishing, no, all those trails were already there. Um, you know, that, that country was widely used. Uh, and so those, those type of caves, they did exist. Uh, you know, Apaches moved around constantly. And if it wasn't necessarily a spiritual cave, we also had what we call the cash system, where we hid supplies. Uh, you know, you hear stories of Apaches being attacked, and, you know, once the military figured out that they could attack us at night, which was a vulnerability for most Indians, uh, historically Indians did not fight in the wintertime and at night. That was just a sort of a common courtesy among most tribes. Not at night, not in the wintertime, it was too difficult for families. And so you didn't want to risk getting attacked also, so you didn't attack people. And so, uh, once they figured out that, they started doing those type of tactics. And so they would attack a, a camp, everybody would scatter half naked, you'd look at the group maybe a week or two later, they'd be fully outfitted again. And that's because some of these caves that are very present throughout this country were often used as supplies. Um, were they pictographs? I can't remember if they were, I think they were those, that cave you're talking about, ma'am? Yes. If it was a if you remember that you saw pic pictographs, yes, yeah, yeah, pictographs. That was common for us. The pictographs. Who's um, Is that very bad that we videoed them and that they're on? And then later we felt bad. We thought yeah. that's probably a sacred place that we just desecrated it or something. Uh, that's one. That's been one of our difficult expressions regarding our country here is that in reality the whole country is sacred to us we don't we don't identify one sacred point now we have to sort of accommodate that because uh, in dealing with agencies they want to know specifics they want to be able to put it down on GPS and all that kind of stuff but to us this whole country was sacred that's why we protected it the way we did that's how we lived on it uh, as, as I mentioned Plants were our biggest uh, food sources. Um, to hunt an animal, it had to fit four categories. It had to be four-legged. It had to be air-breathing. It had to be grass-eating. And it had to be a uh, herd animal. So we only really hunted to, to eat was uh, uh, antelo uh, antelope, deer, and elk. Everything else we sort of left alone. We was understood. Fish we have. On the menu? What's that? Was fish on your menu? No, that you know the way that we the way that we uh, shared stories with the uh, with the young kids was and to impress them is what we had a taboo stories and taboo stories were supposed to impress the kids as they're younger to start understanding our cultural restrictions and our cultural laws and. One of them was with animals. We had taboos about animals that you didn't touch, you didn't mess, you didn't bother. Uh, fish was one because it didn't, to us, it didn't breathe air, it lived underwater. Even though they do, we understand now they, how the <laughs> gills work. Um, it's always been one of my things is, is that I'm very interested why we live the way we did and, and understanding why those particular animals. Turkey was another one. So we thanks need turkey. No, Thanksgiving is really difficult for us. <laughs> uh, uh, pig mm. and predators. Other animals. Has four legs and breathes. Yeah, but it eats lizards. 
the javelina, they were, they're known to be carnivorous, so any animal that is carnivorous and a predator, we left turkey, eats lizards, mm -hmm. bugs, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so it, it, we were very cognizant of those details related to our health, our stamina, our physique, every, everything that related around to us being able to survive. And so when you hear stories that Apache, you know, the, the archaeologists and anthropologists that Apache just came several hundred years ago and we didn't really stay, we just passed through, there is no way that our knowledge would accommodate such a short stay here. We were nothing like the Pueblos. We didn't have to grow food. We didn't have to build houses. We didn't have to make pottery. Uh, you know, our lifestyle revolved around a very light impact on our land. Uh, unfortunately for us, we have that attraction with, with uh, people negating our existence. You know, when I first got here and I went around to see what people said, one of the first things I, one of the first things I heard was, see, you guys didn't even leave anything. No pottery shards, no ruins, you guys didn't leave, you know, this over here, rocks, and, and it's like, well, that's because we didn't live that way. You know, uh, our camps are very short, maybe three weeks to, at the most, maybe a month if we were lucky. But three reasons to move camp. Uh, the harvest was done, because that's why we were there, to harvest, whether it's piñon, agave, daddle, mesquite. Uh, the next one was sanitation. We were, we were deathly afraid of, of things that would hurt us, so sanitation was one. And then the third one, a death. Okay? We had somewhat of a, a fear of death. Okay? Culturally and historically, Apaches do not do funerals. They do now. It's, it's become because of laws with the state. Uh, you, you see <coughs> funerals more often. But historically, it was a family that took care of the dead individual. We do have stories of certain individuals that gathered a mourning. Uh, Cochise is one. Um, I'm sure Mangus Coloradus would have also had one, but it wasn't allowed. Uh, not with what happened to him. Uh, and so, under those conditions, we were constantly moving, you know. And one of the things back to moving that I thought of, of the cliff dwellings is that when I've challenged the cliff dwellings, the archaeologists and anthropologists, I've asked them, and maybe some of you guys here, uh, when you've gone to the cliff dwellings, did anybody see the shoes they found? In the cliff dwellings, at the museum, at the, maybe the, not the visitor center, but I think the, the actual cliff dwelling, the museum, they have a, a, sh a pair of shoes that they found. Okay, and we keep telling them, you guys are ignoring everything. The pair of shoes are woven sandals. Okay, even the shoes tell you where they came from. From the south. From Apache's north, we use moccasins. From us south, they use sandal. That's what they found at the cliff dwelling. So even the shoes indicate a path of movement. Um, I don't want to take too much time. Questions? Yeah. yeah. If, when you say that you moved quite often, did you ever, how do I want to say, was it always someplace different or did you over time come back to the same locations sometimes? Um, we understood areas that were very fertile as far as fruits and plants and stuff like that. And so there were certain areas, depending on, on the amount of on the amount of water, the amount of space, there were certain areas that we favored, but it wasn't like, you know, we camped at the same place all the time. Uh, there might be some movements, but I know that there's areas like um, uh, the uh, Red Paint Canyon, Ojo Calienta by Monticello, and, you know, just west of TRC. Uh, that was another place that we understand that there was an emergence point. Uh, there's a red paint cave, they call it there. And um, that's also a, a favorite area, Cienega. Uh, you know, and so some of the movements uh, were out of necessity. We might return to the same area. Uh, it was such a large cycle that we had that sometimes it, we wouldn't come to an area for maybe two years. The reason I asked was at the south end of the Floridas, on some of those big boulders, mm -hmm. there was 
you know, holes about that big around that are pretty yeah. deep that I thought maybe were used for grinding, yeah. you yeah. know, to, to make, you know, bread and that. And there, yeah. some of them were pretty deep, which led me to believe yeah. that it's, whoever was there might have been there uh, for a long time. And, and yeah, or I mean, come back. You, you figure we're talking thousands of years, right. you know, yeah. and so, you know, over that span of time, uh, areas became, and we understood that, you know. Um, I know that we didn't use pottery, okay, it was just impractical for us, so we used, we used baskets. This is a basket, a Apache made basket, it's more of a gift, but we didn't use pottery because it was just impractical for us, and we used woven <coughs> baskets. If you guys aren't familiar with it, we used, uh, which was another plant-based um, um, acknowledgement out of the piñon. Piñons produce these big globs of pitch, and it's really soft when it starts out, and that's what we would use, collect it. So we're all, we were always looking for those, those, those specific plants that produce the best. I mean, even among plants, we understood them as individuals, you know, which ones had better leaves, better fruit, that kind of stuff. Uh, considering the arid conditions down here, how did they take water along with them when they, if they had no pottery, yeah. how did they carry water? Uh, well, we, we have what's called a tus, which is a pitch-covered container, ah, okay. but it, we hated to carry stuff. That was one of the things. And so the stories my grandfather tells me is that back then, uh, which I understand started changing maybe uh, early 1900s and I think into 1938. Uh, my grandfather says that when they would travel from the Sierra Madre into the Gila and Pass, uh, whether they were just traveling looking for stuff or stealing horses or whatever they were doing, he says that along some of these corridors, the, you know, over by the Peloncillos and these places, there were water. There was water. There were pools of water. My grandfather tells, tells me that they'd come into these pools maybe every 20 miles. Huh. Every 15 to 20 miles there'd be these pools, large pools, three or four feet of water, clear water. And so that there was no thirst. There was no privation. Apaches flourished. You know, we were, some, we were strong people. Uh, you know, the military couldn't keep up with us, couldn't keep up with the women. You know, Apaches, we have a saying, your legs are your best friends. So everything we did growing up was to strengthen your stamina, your legs, your body, um, so you could take these rigors. But it wasn't about military, because that's what it became for. Now we, when we discuss rites of passage for girls and boys, we talk about the boys. The girls, we still have those rites of passage. Uh, luckily for us, we were able to hang on to those rites of passage. The girls' puberty ceremonies that, that go on. But for boys, they were outlawed because it produced warriors. But it wasn't about producing warriors. Yes, once you became a man, you were conditioned, you were strong, you were alert, you were keen. You couldn't help yourself. That's what you were to defend your people. But it was about living with this land being able to survive it, being able to live comfortably and flourish from it, not just survive. We didn't just survive. <coughs> we had a culture, we had songs, we had religion, we had everything that a culture was supposed to have. What is the connection uh, with the Chiricahua's National Monument in Arizona just west of here, 120, 30 miles? Well, the, you know, the, these particular areas, and Bill may allude to that's more of his people. I come from the Warm Springs people. Uh, you know, what, what we have here is sort of this, this map. Uh, and, you know, it, the best way to do it is, um, I think, where are we? We're about down here, right here. But typically, this is sort of the rough sketching of our country. Okay? And so, the... History makes us out to be these warriors going out to kill people and just wandering around and running back and forth. We tell people that we have documented, we had negotiated for eight reservations. And we know where they are. Eight reservations. So we tried to settle. We weren't out just killing people. <laughs> we tried to settle. Actively. Mangus, Colorado died for it. You know? Uh, because we wanted to settle. We, that, that was, war was not something we lived on. Well, the U.S. had a lot of uh, background, the government, uh, 
United States had a real strong background of breaking treaties all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a kind way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, so, yeah, the, the, the attempt by us to, to settle, uh, you know, we tried. We tried tremendously over and over and over again. But as soon as we would settle somewhere and we'd get productive and we'd start producing, we'd start living again, uh, somebody would come in for one reason or another, it's time to go, we need this, we need that, and you need to move. Or they'd shoot us out, kill us, make us run away, and then they'd plant their flag and they'd take it over. Um, the value of this land, just uh, as, as the, one of these points, the value of this land is so extensive that there are no reservations in this region. Okay, they were not about to let any of us stay. Okay, uh, in our country, in our country. Go. Ahead. Exactly. Um, you probably know this, but a lot of people don't know that there was a very large reservation that was in existence from 19, 1872 mm -hmm. to about 1874, yeah. and it was at the the southeast corner of Arizona. Yeah. When it ran along the U.S.-Mexico border towards Tucson below I-10. So it was about almost two million acre reservation. Yeah. And the congressional delegation in Arizona Territory, along with the mining interests, forced Congress and the President to delete, eliminate that reservation. <laughs> I'm going to have something to say about that. And, uh, <laughs> and and so, my, so, my fourth great grandfather negotiated that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And That's that was the of end people. of the war yeah. if the White Eyes had kept their promises. Yeah. And they didn't because of yellow metal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's been a. I, I'm a film person. There's all kinds of films about Apaches, and they always are portrayed as the most vicious of all the Indian tribes. Um, is there any film that you could recommend that really is, comes close to being the essence of an Apache? It's not just Hollywood bull. Yeah. Is there um, any film that you're aware of? The closest one that I'm familiar with that was not uh, big screen is uh, Geronimo. Um, <coughs> It's uh, by the Ted Turner Network. You know who and directed or anything? No. Uh, the, the guy that plays, which was odd, that plays Geronimo is a, guy, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Running Fox. But he's a Pueblo guy. Um, you know, with all the Apaches they had to pick from, they picked a Pueblo guy. But he did a good job for, for, what, it, for what it is. And so uh, Geronimo, the Ted Turner one, talks, you know, it, it, it follows more of Geronimo's upbringing rather than the fighting, which is always there, but it's more about his, you know, getting a wife, uh, relationships, culture, marriage, things like that. So it's a little bit more cultural than it is military. So you can actually watch it without cringing the whole Yeah, level. yeah, th there's going to be points where you cringe and, you know, as they always have done with us, no matter One what One last, real quick little okay. question. Bothered me for a long time, but I've heard that uh, you mentioned Cochise tried to dominate the Tarahumara Indians in the Copper Canyon area. Is you have any light to shed on that? To dominate them? Yeah, that's uh, what I was no, thinking. you know that there 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 was an Apache, um, I guess, protocol or behavior that we were not shy of going to punish somebody mm -hmm. if they came into our country and did something that we didn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, that happened, you know, occasionally, where we'd go and attack somebody to show them. But Apaches and most tribes, un uh, under their own existence, we all had our own demographics. Mm -hmm. Our demographics have been set for a long time. Apaches, we didn't go out to conquer people. We, you know, if they were within our country, yeah. But typically we didn't go out of our country to go attack people. We stayed within our own country, we protected our own country. The only one I've ever heard that might have traveled, and I came across it in a story, was Geronimo. That he got to a place that the lake was so large that he couldn't see across. He probably went to the Baja. <laughs> That's as far as he made it. You know, my grandfather was known to be gone for a year from home. 
uh, we traveled a lot, we moved around, we weren't shy about our country. But that's the only time I've ever heard of a story where we actually moved out of our traditional territory. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think that we're thank you. I think we're we're having a really productive uh, dialogue and I appreciate the thoughtful questions. So now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Mr. William Bradford, <coughs> who is the other director of the Chiricahua Apache Apache National Foundation. He's a council member of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, a warrior, a veteran, an activist, legal counsel, husband, dad, son, and brother. So would you give a warm Columbus welcome to the uh, Thank you. Uh, my mom is Carla Hemis, my father is Tommy Cheese, uh, both Chilconan. Uh, they came from the Sierra Madres, crossed the border, uh, got sent to boarding school in Michigan <laughs> um, at the Hemis Pueblo. I didn't want them drawing rations there, I suspect. Um, so that's where I grew up, uh, away from here, kind of orphaned in diaspora, and that's not uncommon for a lot of our people because that was the intent. Um, before I do that, I'm going to flip a coin. This is from the 150th anniversary of the Cochise Howard Agreement, <clears throat> October 10th or 11th of 1872, where that reservation was established. It was done by, ratified subsequently, uh, but it was done by delegated power from Grant under an executive order. But it was an adumbration, which is a big long word, to the Treaty of Santa Fe of 1852, which left open the question of what were the exact boundaries of the Chiricahua Apache Nation. Why? Because it didn't need to be identified. The U.S. Border Commission came down in 1851, uh, and Mangas and Cochise were both of the, of the belief, let's make friends with the Americans. So they try, uh, signed a treaty of amity, peace, and commerce. And they recognized each other. That's federal recognition. Anybody who's been in the Army knows what that means. Listen up. Federal recognition in the form of a treaty. That treaty is still extant. It was signed by Millard Fillmore and ratified by the U.S. Senate. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Hold on to that. I'm going to flip a coin. The coin from the 150th anniversary of that occasion where I and my cousin Tina spoke sandwiched around another fellow uh, who has slightly different opinions that aren't as informed, I, I, I would not say, uh, about our history, which is binational, by the way. We're on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we hold up in the Sierra Madre, even in good times. Why? It was cool, and it was abundant. It was a Garden of Eden in that stronghold. It was safe. We could have our families. We could do what we do best, which is not war, although we're gold medal quality. It is loving our families, goofing around, because we're actually a pretty funny people. Uh, we'd like to turn that frown upside down, but we need some help, and we're going we're gonna to come to that in a second. So I'm going to flip this coin and see which version of my talk I'm going to give you. Okay, you get the good one, the nice one. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little bitter. I've lost a number of family members to suicide because of the intergenerational trauma. Um, may they rest in peace. But I'm here because they came before. And I have children, and we need to do things to make it better for them. And that's what we're about. And in that, we're not different from other people. We're like other people, I think, but maybe sometimes more so. Because we're very impassioned, and we're very principled. We, we live by our own principles and expect others to abide by those same principles which are the same, I think, that are at the core of the belief systems of most people, except when it gets warped out of greed. So I mentioned before in relation to that million acre reservation that you described, maybe it was closer to two million. It was extensive, it was abundant, there was game. That was the end of the Apache Wars in 1872. And Joe's people wanted to come there if they couldn't stay at Canera Almosa, the uh, Warm Springs, now Mon Monticello. 
They wanted to come. And the government said no, because the government wanted to push them to San Carlos, which is where Apache people of all different stripes, not just Chiricahua, go to suffer. And that was the goal, to get us away. Why? To clear the land. Why? So that they could get the metal. That lust for the gold and silver. We've learned now that you don't even need to have gold, gold and silver to create wealth. You just create it in computers. <laughs> That's what the fed, if only they'd figured that out back then. Maybe, maybe that would have worked even better than the reservation system. Um, but here we are. Okay. What's the most frightening word in the Southwest United States? Drought. Drought. Think back. It do, drought doesn't matter if you're... Famine. Even worse than that. Apache, specifically Chiricahua. Why? Because we, we were the terrors, right? We were the devil himself. We were tigers in the flesh. We were vicious to be exterminated because we were inconsistent with civilization. At least that's what Hearst and his newspapers had to say. And why was that? Because we fought to protect our land. Joe mentioned warriors. We're warriors. Every Chiricahua boy is born a warrior, but for what purpose? And this is existential, this is spiritual. It is because we believe, and I get chills, and I hope I say this right, ancestors and creator, that the creator put us here for one reason, which is to defend and protect this place. Defend it and protect it against those that would despoil it, destroy it, throw it out of balance. What does digging in the earth and using all those chemicals do? It poisons the water. We're responsible for the water, the air, the land, the animals, the plants, and the spirits. It's about obligation. So we train ourselves, we trained ourselves traditionally through our DECOS program, the uh, apprentices, to be able to carry out that role. The covenant with the Creator. And that's why we kept our bodies as best we could. We were in some senses, they've called us the Spartans of, of Native America. And to some extent we became that, we adapted to become that. But that was never our highest value. Our highest value was to be at peace and harmony, as Joe said. And it was taken from us, and it's still been taken from us, because we're not at peace and in possession of our own land. And so when you see sometimes, maybe you see I look like an angry angry person in the vein of maybe Russell Means or Dennis Banks, I've heard that before. There's, there's a reason for it, and I try to temper it, and I try to be diplomatic and, and political, even though I don't like it. But it's necessary, and we do this. And part of the reason that we're here is to impart things to you in the hope that we can win your hearts and minds. So let me dig into my notes, which I did well, we were driving here, and it has the form of chicken scratch. A couple times we went over railroad tracks, and it gets even worse. So please bear with me, and um, if I have to stop and, and uh, take a peek. Oh, okay, so this is the future's history. We can't do anything about the history before, but we can do everything about this history within the limits of what we're capable of, and that's really limited only by our mental creativity and our energy and our willingness to put our spirit behind our work. Um, and I think that's important. So, I wish I was speaking before a futurity association or society, not just history. And in fact, I think every good history association or society is thinking about the future too, and how it connects the past, present, and future. Because that's all we do, all we've ever done. You've heard about the seven generations. Well, it's actually three before this one and three ahead. It's not just seven down the road, but anyways. Um, there always is a, a forethought. What are we doing, and is it consistent with the, what the ancestors taught us and what the next generations need? Okay, so that's, we're, we're historians in that regard, and, and invariably. Um, we talked about the, uh, the Hearst. They created us to look bloodthirsty because any opposition to what the dominant group wants is by definition gonna be the bad guys. Well, you, it's true of every country, their foreign policy, at 1984 is great. We've always been at war with Oceania, or always been at war with this group. You know, it, you have to demonize the enemy in order to do things to them that you wouldn't otherwise do. And consistent with American law, policy, and morality of the second half of the 20th century, 
That was not permissible. There were rules. In the Civil War, there was the Lieber Code of how you had to govern the conduct of military operations. That was when it was fighting between white men and white men, or with blacks on both sides. But when it came to natives, oh no, no. That was too important. We need that land, and therefore we're going to come up with a new rule set. Either the land is empty of people, or the land doesn't have any people on it because those are animals. In fact, we're worse than animals because livestock had value. We did not. Of course, entrepreneurs then figured out how to take our scalps and monetize them. And that became the law even in New Mexico, at least informally, into the 20th century. They wanted our land. They wanted our land. And we are the people of the land with the covenant to protect it. In a sense, it was a holy war. We had no choice. We had no op uh, uh, options. And we knew soon that it was a losing war. My ancestor Cochise was fighting the battles, Victorio, uh, Nana, Loco. They all knew how it was going to end. They knew, and yet there was nothing more they could do. They had to. Uh, we can talk about the, the final surrender of Geronimo. That was no surrender. That was a recognition that he did not want to inflict any more, and the, the men in his band, Nietzsche, my third great-grandfather, and Fun, and a few others told him, if you don't bring an end to this, we'll kill you ourselves. And it was because they cared so much about their women and children. We fought delaying actions. All the time, we would stand there so that they could get away, the women and children, and then fall back. And then there might be two or three of us dead, and we had pinned down the enemy by fire, not even killing many of them, because that was not our goal. We're not bloodthirsty. We wanted them to live and survive, and if we slaughtered uh, them like we could have, then they would have recruited cavalry from all over the country and sent them on our tails. It was a strategic and then a tac operational and then a tactical game. How do we just survive? Nothing's changed. We're still there. Um, so, where are we now? In the present, looking toward the future. We're in a process of national reconstruction. Joe talked about bringing people back here. We're trying to do that. Uh, and how? What do we need to achieve? What's our goal? Well, we want to recover our territory. So this is a vast stretch of territory. We know we're practical people. That is one thing you can say about us, that it is true. We're very practical. We're not going to get all of this back. There are people here that have settled. Our motto, like Joe said, is peace and harmony and neighborliness. We say to them, we would disturb no private titles. But there's vast public land here that we claim still, and the treaty recognizes, and the Cochise-Howard Agreement, and the other reservations that were negotiated here are ours by law, by right, and morality. The federal government has played this game, duping people to think that their misconduct for long periods of time can somehow acquire the patina of justice. Well, that's not how it works. And we're calling, we're using, here's our strategy. We're using information to try to achieve the goals, to bring our, recover territory, to bring our people back, to have our sovereignty recognized, which, is, which would mean the treaty to be affirmed and then a Land Claims Settlement Act that we could use to say, okay, and I'm not spe specific as to anything, I'm not even pretending to draw accurately, but, you know, there's big parts of, of this, you know, big part of that's public land, some public land here, let's say. You could put it together in such a way that we could have our capital, we could have our reserve rights land, we could have the kind of industry upon it that's light and green in such a way as to create jobs, increase the human capital of everybody around us? And how would we do that? There are trust programs with the federal government for in, throughout Indian country. Part of the treaties said in exchange for cessation of hostilities, the U.S. will undertake certain promises. Among those are, we will provide annuities for health, education, welfare. And Indian policy at some points was governed by sometimes the Quakers had a great influence. And so they were trying to do things to, now, albeit, civilize the, uh, the man by killing the Indian inside him. You know, so Christianizing and all these things. Um, it's natural for uh, a powerful group to want to impose its values on others. It, ha it happens the worldwide. But at least they had a moderating effect on policy. So there was an effort to try to moderate and mitigate. 
but it was the mining and the ranching that blew that up. And they were, you heard about the original idea of lobbying. Grant would sit at a hotel have, with a bottle of whiskey and have people come and talk to him in Washington, D.C. That's how it started. The name of the hotel uh, escapes me. But the point is, the miners and the ranchers had his ear, and even the army and the Indian agents, some of them well motivated, could not stop that crush. Okay, but ranching has come and gone. There's still ranches, but it's a bygone era. If you want to look at grass and grazing and big fat cows, look in Florida, Georgia, over there. They never should have come here. This is not the right place for them. This is ungulate place, ungulate land, uh, north of here, Buffalo. But the land is suited for what's there and not invasive species such as the cattle work. All right. But the mining is even worse because the mining digs into the ground. Joe talked about picking it up off the ground, but this is different. There's a, uh, a mine right now. It's up in Mogollon, New Mexico. Has anybody ever heard of the process, what's going on up there? So there's a company from Canada called Suma Mining. They're a silver mining company. Mm -hmm. They want to go back into old finds that have been untouched since World War II, uh, left because of the war. Recommence uh, exploration as a prelude to drilling and will probably sell to a major. There is a predicate for this. So we can now look to recent history, which laps into the present, Oak Flat in Arizona. Anybody heard about that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got one. Can you tell us a little bit, Professor? It's a similar thing. It's, it's a mining interest, and it's caused a huge uproar. The environmental pollution, the degradation, and a lot of Apache groups are fighting against it because it's sacred land. Exactly. So there's a sacred site. Environmental groups are interested for reasons that kind of surround that, but at its most pure essence, it's a sacred site. And the government's argument is, in the Ninth Circuit, a panel, <coughs> excuse me, said so, that you don't have a First Amendment right, or even a right under the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, not to have your site of worship completely destroyed. That's not within the Constitution or a statute. And the, the, uh, the Save, Save Oak Flat, which is a group that's co comprised of a former chairman of the San Carlos Apache, they're Western, they're cousins, they're not the same as we are, but some of ours were dumped there too. Anyways, they're contesting this, the full panel, the uh, full uh, en banc uh, Ninth Circuit will hear this next month. And it might go to the Supreme Court. I've talked to the lawyers there. We're getting ready to, if need be, bring them into our situation because that is a sacred site. Where, where they're drilling right now and where they want to expand. Let me tell you about that. Mogollon Mountains. Anybody heard of them or been there? Okay. It's beautiful. It's, we believe, literally, it's God's country. Now, Joe said nothing is, is non-sacred which is true, but there are places that there are stories and, and ethics that are taught there that are so powerful that we accord them in our minds specialness and, and we, we seek to protect those uh, against certain things, especially mining. The Bogollons where, is where our night and day story comes from. Anybody, you probably don't know the night and day story, I'll tell you. Man didn't get fire, Chiricahua didn't get fire from, from Yusin, the creator, and weren't supposed to have it yet. A coyote comes around, and says to man, to Chirico, how about some fire? We say yes. We take the fire, crater sees it, says, I'm gonna take away the day and you're gonna have eternal night now. He tried to get the jump on me and it wasn't right. And who benefits? The nocturnal animals, many of which are predators. Snake is among them. And that's the reason that we don't eat fish or <coughs> traditionally didn't eat fish because that fits into the snake family for us. And an additional reason, all right. Snake, owl, bear, other night animals, night predators. The day animals hate this. The night animals like it. So they say, let's have a duel to the death and solve this. If the day animals win, day comes back. If not, it's night forever. Coyote sits there and jumps in on either side when they have the battle. Whichever side is getting the upper hand, he goes to the other. They call that, uh, it's kind of like the great power rivalry in, in international politics, you know, the offsetting things. All right, so. The battle ends, the day animals win, the night animals flee, the bear came down this way and into the Deming area. That's the, the traditional story. But the point is, you don't take that which is not yours. That's the first lesson, which we did and got punished for it. The second thing is, you may have to fight to, 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 to fight for, the, for right against wrong. You may have to. You may have to fight for something of value. 
And the third thing is, um, um, shoot, I lost this. Oh, you have to restore balance. That's the reason for fighting. It's not for gain. Gain comes when it's supposed to come, but you fight to restore balance. So that mind is there. We've talked to them. We've asked them not to continue to extend in our sacred sites. They have not committed to that. And uh, we're prepared to challenge it and to do what we can to stop it. Um, but we need help. And so I, I, I put that out to you for your consideration uh, to look into it a little bit more. And okay, so we have various instruments of, of policy. We have ideas. That, that's the most powerful thing in information. Diplomacy, uh, political engagement, economics. How do we use these? Well, we've got a state re-recognition bill. We've got local representatives who are in support. We're going to bring this before the relevant committees and try to get that restoration here. Um, remember, the reason that we don't exist, according to some who would have it that way, is because we're a threat. We, we could cloud people's land titles. By us asserting our right to this land, people fear that, oh my gosh, will my house be taken away? Or will I have a hard time selling it? No. Now, these same issues have been raised in Maine, in New York, in Alaska, other places. We can do it here. Nobody needs to worry. So we need, but we need to express that and help people understand that and work with the politicians to get there. So that's one important course of action. Um, we have people that are donating territory to us, our, our traditional lands back. That's an important initiative. We're developing grants to be able to do the things Joe mentioned, to build our ceremonial grounds and headquarters at Fort Baird in Santa Clara, New Mexico. Um, let's see. We do presentations such as this to, to explain what we're about and to get the word out. And, uh, and so, here we are. We're, we're uh, biggest obstacles. I don't have time to go into it. And I'm not going to mention anybody. You're recording this, I understand. Yeah, okay, so I'm not going to say much except um, our, our biggest potential, I don't want to say enemies, impediments. Uh, are those that we are close to in history, culture, and in some cases, genetics. Um, they have a different interest in economic development in the area. Uh, we are not interested in gaming. Um, we are more interested in using the land in a gentle way, in, in a sustainable way. We can have those differences and work together. History, and I would not like to have a, that talk recorded. I wouldn't mind coming for a talk on what exactly this is about, but it can be recorded and it's got to be Chatham House rules, yeah. which I think if you understand what they are, yeah. no attribution to any person, person what was said, but we can speak freely. That's a, I'll leave that for another time. But our biggest rivals have always been ourselves, our biggest impediments. Back in traditional days it was the scouts. You couldn't find us without our own people. And our own people right now can be our best friends or our worst enemies. That's part of our diplomacy that we need to try to reach their hearts. They've not made it easy, but I hope that that changes. We'll see. Okay. Um, here's our victory conditions. Here's, here's what, what the world will look like when we, when we are where we should be. Um, restoration of at least a significant part of our land base so that we can do the things we've described. A recognition of our sovereignty so that we can make our own rules, which would probably be more protective of the natural environment. And that's pretty much as far as it would go. It's not going to be drastically distinct, but we need to be able to perform our ceremonies and gather the things we need from the land to do it without having to ask, Mother, may I? Joe has to pay over $3,000 a year to the Forest Service to indemnify them against any potential injuries when he takes trips out there. Think about that for a second. Um, okay, so we'll be back in peace and harmony. We'll have prosperity. Uh, and the word Chiricahua will become a synonym for friends and neighbors. That's all. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes, Can you direct us to any sites, websites, or any place to learn more about this? I'll let Joe field that question. Um, well, we have, we have uh, one website right now we call the Chiricahua Apache National Foundation. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that was our effort to kind of you know start the dialogue about who we are. Uh, we're in the process of rebuilding uh, the Chiricahua Apache Nation website. It's still still not up, but we're in the process of building it up. 
Um, outside of that, I'm you know it's, it's difficult to say. Um, you know there are some good books that you can read, but um, I've come across some pretty crazy wild stories, which is part of our ability or part of our effort to understand our own history. Uh, and, and so going just on the internet can be risky. Um, I came across a story of this one woman claiming to be Apache that somebody asked her to explain how Apaches got here and according to her, her story was that they came from up north and they came floating down and the crown dancers were ahead of them like some kind of scouts and uh -huh. <coughs> that they were looking, they found this place. <coughs> well, that, that follows the American Lambridge theory and that's not, you know, as I tell people, if these people, these Pueblo people had really come from the north, we'd be seeing petroglyphs, pit houses, kivas, cliff dwellings, villages all the way from Canada here, but they do not exist. Everything stops at the demarcation along uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. That's where everything stops. Further up than that, you don't see anything else. That's because that's where they stopped. Any understanding why? They came from the south. They came from the south, but why did they stop there? Too why cold. don't we see exactly. Canada? Why don't we see Wyoming? Too cold. It was too cold. Can't These grow. people grew food. <laughs> they farmers. stopped there <laughs> because that's as far as they could get. They realized now we're into six, seven, eight months of winter. It didn't work for them. So they stayed there. They tried to live. And then they, our understanding is some of them just remigrated, remigrated south. Do you know Gil Aguilera? Is he the Alliance Apache Council? Is that right? Is that part? He's a. He's a. Uh, yeah. He's well, we've evolved. One of our. Uh, one of our, our. When we first organized, see, I. I uh, when I came back to this country, I, I asked too many questions, and uh, I got targeted. Uh, I was uh, arrested. Uh, my eagle feathers were confiscated, and I went after them. Uh, you know, and, and so it, I spent eight years in court uh, mm -hmm. fighting the federal government over my eagle feathers because people don't realize that the federal government still controls Indian religion. Mm -hmm. You have to be federally recognized, you have to go get your feathers at the Eagle Repository, and then you can practice your religion. Well, we, I didn't follow that. Okay, so when they arrested me, they asked me, well, what are you? I said, Chiricahua, Warm Springs. Well, you guys aren't federally recognized. We are. We have a treaty. Well, Never we, let anybody tell you that we're not federally so recognized. So I, I got into the yeah. fight, and it, it, I four hearings, one in El Paso, one in Las Cruces, uh, well, almost five, uh, one in Albuquerque, one in Boulder, Colorado, and then and then Denver, because uh, after the second hearing, I got my feathers back from a judge in uh, Albuquerque. Judge Meacham. Uh, it was amazing to sit in these courts and then the federal government kept appealing so we kept going up the line but I got my feathers after the second hearing. But every hearing was like a history lesson to these judges. Uh, one judge in Albuquerque, nine judges in Boulder, twelve judges in Denver. And it was like history seminars to these judges because they understood nothing about Chiricahua because that's what the world has done to us. They've pushed us down to make us disappear because we are the voice of this land. And, you know, as I was talking about, you look at our traditional country, we understand the reservations of San Carlos, White Mountain, Mescalero, but in our traditional territory there is none. Okay? What is there now that accounts for value? It's all national forests. Four national forests. Gila, Apache, Cibola, Coronado. That's our country. And we want it back. Okay, it's all public land. What for? We're the best ones to take care of it. We're are the ones that understand it. Are there those that would like to uh, try living the old way yet? I do. I'm an outfitter. I live in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> travel with horses. He's the roughest chair uh, cow there is. I, 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 I teach people about plants, how to live in the environment, how not to leave marks. Would you like um, to see some of your youth in that direction? We have a program now called Horse Holders, and that's about getting kids into the wilderness. Uh, we just started it, so we're developing it, and we're going to continue you know, doing this for kids and try to bring kids into the wilderness and teach them how to survive, uh, how to live, how to be frugal. 
let me say this, though, as to that. Um, we are adaptable people, highly. And so there are certain things about the natural world now, uh, the built environment or technology that are essential, mm -hmm. and we've always taken and borrowed and shared and traded, and should be. as it should be. And I think everybody should be closer to the, the natural world, but also adaptable too. Yeah, if they, like Bill mentioned, if they would have asked us, we would have said, you know, west of the Mississippi, keep the buffalo, manage them. Yep. Mm -hmm. East of the Mississippi, grow all the cows you want. <laughs> I mean, this land has literally changed because of those forces. Okay. You know, the cattle, the cattle companies that came in here in the early 1900s, you know, uh, along with that kind of pressure on the water and resources, that's why we have now a bunch of just creosote fields. Yeah. Like, it, grandfather, and and yeah, else. grandfather used to tell that it was just seas of grass yeah, through these yeah. plains, yes. you know, the... Yeah. The greatest fear of a family traveling through this country was losing their kid in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. Yes, ma'am, you had a talk. Well, I, okay, everybody knows I'm sort of I'm goofy, and I usually, sometimes people wish I would shut up, but here's what I want to know. Uh, maybe I'm part of Apache, except I'm so white, because I ask a lot of questions, and I've been accused of having more balls than brains. If you get your land back, you say that doesn't mean people will lose their homes and stuff, but doesn't it? I mean, how can you know? There are so many non-natives that live on reservations in this country. Most of them are checkerboard quilts. A vast, the, the population of some reservations has more non-natives than natives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you ask how this is possible, because sometimes the feds opened up areas of it to, to settlement, and there have been fractionization where somebody has four kids, each of them has four kids. It's not manageable to have just, so they sell it. And then those sales have been approved by the Department of Interior. So <coughs> what I think people will find is that uh, nothing really will change except for maybe the management of natural resources, fires, um, game, and that sort of thing, and that we'll have our own police to be able to... Uh, police our own laws just like every jurisdiction does with cross-jurisdictional agreements and so on. It's, the more things will change, the less they will, at least for those who are not Chiricahua. The, and, and this is borne out across Indian country. And in fact, people live often so close together and there's tourists that come to the reservations for casinos and shows and other opportunities. So. The, the, the physical borders are breaking down, but the point is we would like that land recognized as ours and subject to our land and custodial management. That's really kind of the key. So that sort of ties in with climate change because that would certainly help. Well, we need to be able to take care of the effects and mitigate them where we can. Now, you had said some, asked a question about film, and now before we run out of time and people want to take off, we have a, a project in development that lends itself to film and we've talked to a production company and there's a, a good chance and Are you it's talking feature film or documentary? Feature. And it's said in present time. Now so much of a, books about us are told in the past tense. There was a book by Professor Joe Zani's War that came out about 25 years ago. In it he supposedly talks to a Chiricahua informant, I don't, I don't doubt that he did, a Chiricahua informant who said exactly what Joe did. Oh we came from the north with the... and I have my suspicions about who who it might actually be, because anybody that knows better would never say that. But the point is, it's, we've always been written about, and it's always past tense, but never in the present. And the fact is, we can preserve a lot of who we are and still use a computer, drive a, drive a truck, you know, and, and go, to, go to fancy hospitals. And that, one of the things we'd like to do is have a better medical center in Grant County than, than exists right now. And there should be. People don't have adequate health care there. They have to travel everywhere they want to go. We want to incubate uh, education from Head Start to a college, a two-year college, to help develop the kinds of people that will be managers at their <coughs> reservation. So consistent with good land management and prosperity for everybody. That's what we're about. Yes, sir. The, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joy. The, the first Native American, uh, is she a senator or a... Um, Haaland, Holland? Deb Holland, yes. Did, She's the Secretary she, of the Interior right yes. now. Secretary of the Interior. Is she, can you work with her? Is that, is that going to help? Or we would be eager to have Deb Holland come to our assistance on any project that she'd like to. <coughs> eager. <coughs> but we haven't had the opportunity to engage with her yet. 
and we would like to. What does that there's mean? Been, there's, been a, a, there's been a there's been there's been a history. There's been a history of uh, native Washington, you know, uh, you know, political people. I mean, even all the way back from was it uh, Elijah? No, Eli Parker. Eli Parker uh, Eli and Parker. Charles Carr was vice president. Uh, <laughs> what, what's his name? The guy from Colorado. Uh, ben Nighthorse Campbell. Ben Nighthorse Campbell. Our observations has always been that once these individuals, as progressive and as caring as they may be, after they get into those offices, it becomes really hard for them to really do things sometimes. Um, I tried to involve Ben Horse Knight. Ben Nighthorse Campbell in my feather case and it was just kind of over his head he didn't really understand what you know what to do or how he could be even involved um, a lot of people took it just as a uh, you know a case criminal record there was no recognition that it was a cultural uh, effort that it was about us standing up to say yes I am Apache, yes, we used eagle feathers, and I should be able to use it now, and I shouldn't have to go to a federal office to get my uh, items to practice my religion. Um, and, and, you know, so that, that, it became very difficult, and with Holland, we hope we can work with her, but um, up until now, we haven't had the opportunity or the ability to reach her, so. And if she happens to hear this, we're, we're, we're waiting. We know you're busy. Uh, we know there are limitations that are imposed by the politics of various <coughs> issues and the chain of command, but we have some ideas on how we could work with, with her to, to achieve some results that would be good for her home state and good for Indian country and a good legacy. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have, uh, is there a tally as to how many, what is the population of the Apache people in in New Mexico. Ah, well, we can tell you we have 400 citizens. Certainly the numbers are greater. There are a lot of people that walk around as Mexicans that are Apache and Chiricahua especially. And there are some in the neighborhoods where I, where I live in Silver City. And when you tell them, oh, with, uh, Chir oh I, my grandfather's uh, Chiricahua, <laughs> and, you call, and you've called yourself Mexican all this time, that's what we did. We went yeah. to the Sierra Madre and hid because they were looking for us still on the Mexican side of the border for the scouts. Jesus. Yeah, the U.S. Army forgot about oh, us. Yeah. And you know why? They didn't want to have anybody thinking about us. They knew they didn't get us all. But if they admitted that, for how many decades would the war go on? They needed it over, and so did Washington. But we survived down there, or played the Mexican game. There, we don't know the numbers. 400 citizens, 2,000 at least that are enrolled with six Nantani, six chiefs in, in Chihuahua. There might be 10 times that more. They're state recognized in Mexico already. They're ahead of so, our country, and so this country is really, you know, lagging, lagging on that. So. Well, let's face it: the easiest way to take something from someone is to call them your enemy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you can justify anything. Anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this is for everybody. Is there a list of books or any <laughs> re recommended readings that you could maybe give Kathleen that? She could email to us as historical. Yeah, we can come up with one. Uh, so, you know, recommended reading, just that way we could get it uh, distributed to everybody. Yeah. Would be interesting. So, to that, everything has always been written about us by others. There is nothing that's been written by us. And in part, that's because we don't talk about ourselves. We don't, it's something we're, and we were an oral culture. However, the best that there is so far is probably Sweeney. It's a little dry and a little historical, year by year, month by month. But he gets a lot of source material, and a lot of what he says is true. I feel it's slanted, but anyway, uh, Sweeney, Edwin Sweeney. Yeah. Um, there's Eve Ball. Uh, I would say that's a good place to start, and we can get you more. Thank um, you. But nobody understands the reason for the conflict. Nobody comes right down and really gets it. And that's, we have a covenant. It's a holy obligation. And we were put to the wall. And we were fighting to protect our land, our women, our children. We had no choice. We want a choice. We needed a choice. But we never got one. So one question for me to you guys. Where does the word Indian come from? <laughs> Probably something uh, made up in Washington. 
or a newspaper or something. Well, we grew up probably from the Far East. Well, the, 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 story, the common story is that Columbus was looking for a path to India, and when he went west from Portugal or wherever he left from and he landed, uh, he thought he was an Indian, so when he got off the ship, what, whoever he saw, he called Indians. That's not the, that's not the story. Um, what we know is that, first of all, there was a conflict out of Denver, okay, because uh, the Portuguese people in Denver were just really strong about celebrating Columbus Day. Uh, AIM and some of the Indian people started coming out to protest, so there was conflicts, and it got down to being violent. And so there was an effort by what we call native scholars to find out exactly what the situation is and why, you know, again, to educate ourselves so nobody pulls that proverbial wool over our eyes. Uh, what we found out was that, and, and I've asked, I, I've looked into it, is that, no, when Columbus was saving the world, English was not the language. Right. It was Latin that was being spoken and recorded. And it, India did not become India until the British colonized it much later, before, as they have told me, that they call themselves Hindustan, Hindustanis, because of their Hindu religion. So what they did was they went back into Columbus's uh, history and they looked at Columbus's journals, which was a miracle that Spucci was the one that's supposed to document everything Columbus said. So they looked into the journals and what they found that when Columbus landed in the Carib and saw the Carib Indians, he described them in Latin, corpus and Dios, in the body of God. So if you were ever, before even the British colonized here, the French, when you were in this country, in, in South, South uh, United States, Mexico, and South America, native people were called what? Anybody know Spanish? Indios. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it comes from the word en Dios. Okay, it's bastardized from the word en Dios. It's a new word. And so it's actually a compliment. It was not a derogatory statement, so if you know your history, as some of us do, uh, that, that was a compliment to us. So, you know, don't be afraid to call us Indians. And Even over 500 years ago, there were uh, jurists, professors of law in Spain, that were outraged about what the conquistadores were doing. Yeah. And they made reference to this, and they, they even went so far as to go against the Pope, who issued a bull, Intercaterra, which is essentially the book or the gun. Yeah. And uh, so the restraining influence of, of Christianity was there, but it was suppressed by greed. And we still see that today. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.